They're one of the most exciting emerging technology platforms flying in space. They're CubeSats, and many are being built, tested, and monitored by college and high school students. Will Metrivers College successfully launch CUNYSAT-1? How did they get involved with CubeSats? What other CubeSats are flying on Ilana-2? Find out on NASA Edge. Welcome to NASA Edge. An inside and outside look at all things NASA. Hey, what a great uh, night for a launch. We're about 30 minutes away from the Ilana 2 GEMSAT mission. The, the rocket is fueled, but I'm a little low on caffeine. It's very late, <laughs> and I'm hoping that the enthusiasm will carry us all throughout the rest of the night. We're NASA Edge, and we're happy to be here in Lompoc, California, and we'll be joined shortly by a friend of the show and special co-host, Tiffany Nail. Yeah, and we've actually done several shows on CubeSat, but what's really special about tonight is we're actually going to witness them launching into space, and then later in the broadcast, we're going to come back and see them actually deploy in space. So it's a very kind of complete picture of CubeSats now. And we actually have a college who's actually launching the very first CubeSat tonight. The CUNYSAT-1, City University of New York. A couple of weeks ago, we were in Brooklyn at Medgar Evers, and we talked to Shermaine Austin, one of the professors there who helped develop CUNYSAT-1. So Shermaine, how did Medgar Evers College get into the CubeSat business? It goes way back to our first major NASA grant from MUSPEN which is part of the Minority University Research and Education Division. And uh, my program manager at that time, James Harrington, constantly told us, you have to learn how to fly, you have to learn how to fly, because that's what NASA does. And he actually tried to give us a workshop so that we could start thinking about doing missions, you know, mini missions, university missions, partnering with other people. And uh, that never came to pass, but we did have an opportunity to send some students to work on other NASA missions, and we wanted to broaden the scope of that. So our first step in broadening the scope was our BalloonSat program. Tell me a little bit about BalloonSat. BalloonSat programs are run at a number of colleges and universities, not only in the United States, but worldwide. Basically, you put payloads on sounding balloons with communications equipment, GPS receivers, or tracking. You release them. The balloon basically rises to about 100,000 feet in burst, and then the team tracks that balloon and you retrieve the equipment that you okay. put on the balloon. So all this experience that you've accumulated with BalloonSat kind of paved the way to get into the CubeSat business? It was sort of the next step. I mean, once we got into the CubeSat business, we realized that was just a little teeny bit of experience okay. for developing a CubeSat. Kind of take us back to the beginning, the first day of working on the CubeSat till now. I mean, what was that experience like? Well, the first days were very difficult and challenging. We knew absolutely nothing. We started from scratch. I was working in a group of faculty, computer science, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, and we were all sort of learning this from scratch. And it was really difficult to mentor students as a result, because we were like one chapter ahead of the students. So it really took a lot of work to get that up and going. How did you get the students to, to get interested in, in the program? We recruited them. We asked them, do you want to try your hand at you know, participating in a subsystem for a CubeSat. And they said yes. And I understand that you have uh, other universities helping you on this project? Oh yeah, we have, well, first of all, we have students from CUNY, from different CUNY colleges that are participating. You say CUNY, what do you mean by CUNY? CUNY is the City University of New York. It's a public university with 19 senior community colleges and PhD program. From a Medgar Evers perspective, you were able to recruit other students from your local universities in the city. Right. Now, we have had CUNY-wide grants before, where we've worked with a number of colleges and students from a number of colleges, so we have built up a lot of relationships over the years that we were able to use here. We have the United Technologies Aerospace System in Danbury, Connecticut, that helped us with all of our testing, our final testing, random vibration, and our thermal vacuum bake-out, and we have very close ties with the University of Vermont. They actually participated with us in our balloon set for many years. And so they just moved right into the CubeSat with us. Approximately how many students have actually been through the, the CubeSat program? I think it's over 40. Oh, you wow. know, some students come just for a summer. Others come for a semester. Some come for a year. 
the longer they stay, the better the experience is. It continues to be challenging. It's kind of hard to predict because the launch is going to be happening here pretty soon. What's going to be sort of your state of mind? Are you going to be nervous? Yes, very. <laughs> I'll be like this. You know, obviously it's our first effort. We've done everything we can possibly do to test it, to verify that it's going to work. But, you know, there's still the nerves, you know, until we hear from it, you know, we'll be very nervous. And I understand that you're already starting to, to work on a second CubeSat project. Yeah, you know, it's kind of funny because as soon as we delivered, and I took a vacation, <laughs> I couldn't wait to start the second one. I, I felt like it was a learning experience. We made a lot of mistakes. We had to learn from our mistakes, and I'd like to leverage that into doing a new CubeSat. What are some changes that you are going to do this go-around for, for the second well, CubeSat? I think one of the changes is we'll be better mentors for our students. Okay. You know, it's, it's really difficult when you're starting something from scratch to mentor the students in the best possible way. Do you see the enrollment or the enthusiasm increasing from the students? Yes, there's a lot of, you know, students are talking about it to their friends. You know, newer students have come up to me and said, I want to be part of the satellite project. What we want to do the next one is we want to engage high school students, you know, give them a module that they can design. I had a lot of high school students ask to participate in this CUNYSAT 1 CubeSat, but we really didn't have the experience to bring them on in a meaningful way, and I want to do that in the next one. Can we see the CubeSat now? You can't. It's on the rocket right now. Oh. In fact, we haven't even seen our CubeSat for like six months. I'm actually going through CubeSat withdrawal now. And I understand it's, on a, it's in a one by three uh, pea pod that has Cal Poly and University of Michigan. You're actually in between them. Yes, we are in between them. You got your school flag on the, on the pea pod? Well, we figured since we're the first ones to fly out of New York City, we'd just do the New York City thing with the Statue of Liberty and the, and the whole <laughs> bit as our logo. Now, um, Tiffany, tell us a little bit about Ilana. Right now, this is, from what I understand, the, the fifth a launch of CubeSats, but the, the mission that we're covering tonight is called Il Ilana 2. That is correct. Ex explain how that happened. So with any mission, uh, I think this is kind of best reference to shuttle. You get a number associated to it, and then things happen. The manifest changes, therefore everything kind of goes out of sequence. So it's no longer chronological order, it's whatever works out with the manifest, the rocket, and then the CubeSats being ready as well. And, and the good news is, is that obviously for Alana 2, we're ready to go, so we're past all of that. But you got to imagine that it's, it's kind of interesting for all the students and all the schools that are here, they're at that point where they're going to see all their work come to fruition. Which leads us to our, our, our school, Mega Evers. Um, while we were there, Blair, Chris, and myself, we had an opportunity to talk to the students who were dealing directly with their first CUNY set. And it was just great to see how involved and how interested the kids were in the program. We're here with Ernst, who's a systems engineer on CUNYSAT. So what exactly did you do as systems engineer on that project? I had to get everybody on the same page. You know, we would schedule weekly meetings. We would come in, even on Saturdays, Sundays, sometimes I would call, you know, everybody be like, you know, we have to have a meeting. We need to get here. Are the yeah. other students upset with you for always calling them and pestering them all the time? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was like, you know, you're calling me at 2 o'clock in the morning. What's wrong with you, you know? <laughs> but, um, you know, it was all in good effort. And I feel like, you know, there are times when it was rough, but everybody was there and everybody was together. And you know, people would spend Saturdays, we'd spend like six, seven hours, and we would just be, you know, calculating stuff and writing on the board, and it was, it was really fun. Well, you're giving a little bit of flavor. What was the biggest challenge then? One of the hardest things was to communicate with, you know, this new knowledge. Everybody was brand new, fresh, didn't understand everything, and we had to start from the bottom and work our way to the top textbooks, read textbooks, get outside sources, you know, anything that we could do to try to make this project successful, we did. Because we're different schools, we're different locations, that was another issue. I was at Cooper Union, which was in Manhattan, Meg Rivers is in Brooklyn, you know, you had people from, coming from New Jersey, yeah. people coming from Vermont, mm. you know, it was... Wow. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was really, it was that, I feel like, was a real challenge. Got to gotta have good tires to work in the satellite business. Oh, definitely. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about the software that you had to write for CUNYSAT. Well, the command and data handling team, which I was part of, uh, was tasked with writing the software for the microcontroller, which is the 
brain of the satellite. It controls all other subsystems. So it has to juggle, in essence, to make sure that the satellite is functioning properly as it orbits the Earth. How big is a microcontroller in CUNYSAT? Microcontroller is uh, very small. It's about this size. Mm -hmm. And I prefer to think of it as a computer from 1980s because you have the same frequency, the same memory capacity that it has as the computers from 1980s. It's just the power requirement is very low. So it's perfect to uh, control the satellite which operates on the battery power. The actual microcontroller is manufactured by Texas Instrument and it is a modern microcontroller. They manufacture a family of microcontrollers that you can find in all electronics devices. You can find it in medical equipment, I think even uh, electric razors, and it, they control a lot of equipment. Ralph, how did you get involved in developing your satellites? I would say getting in was thought maybe when I was a kid. When I was watching, maybe like the say Buck Rogers. I don't know if you guys heard about it. <laughs> oh, yeah. When he started, they said that the NASA mm -hmm. sent the satellite in space. Maybe like that was the first time I heard about NASA. My next step would be when I was reading uh, Fantastic Four. <laughs> yeah, that's the second step. That's where, you know, you got the taste for it. Yeah. Because before you get involved with something, we got to love it first. Are you sure that you're not really just hoping that some lab accident will happen and you'll be given some superpowers <laughs> that would enable you to be a superhero? Because that's what I'm hoping for. I don't know if that's what... No, uh, sometimes I burn some little components. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, those little accidents happen. But big accident, dangerous situation, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> In the wink of an eye, his life support systems were frozen by temperatures beyond imagination. Cynthia, you're a project manager on CUNYSAT. I also understand that, that your role is not quite over with uh, CUNYSAT. Oh, when, yeah. it, when it deploys in space, there's actually some data collection. So uh, what's going to happen once CUNYSAT deploys uh, from your standpoint? See, well, it's going to be um, admitting CW, which is Morse code. and. In order for us to mess with the transceiver, we need to have a license. And um, I did take an uh, amateur radio license for that reason, to be able to operate um, the transceiver and see if we can get anything from there. So you'll actually verify from a ground station that you're listening to CUNYSAT. How will you know that you're hearing CUNYSAT and not a different satellite? Well, there's this JSAT track, which it's going to basically tell us the position and when it's going to have an overpass on our ground station, so that's how we're going to actually track it. And you'll just try to pick up this Morse code yes, when we're it's gonna in try, the track? Yes, we're gonna try to pretty much position the antennas the right way and hopefully we're gonna pick it up. So what's the message that you expect to hear <laughs> uh, from CUNYSAT? Basically, if we're still alive, um, this is the power, you know, everything's fine, that kind of thing. Oh, so it's not just sending a signal, you're gonna send certain signals saying that different subsystems are working, uh, and, and you know Morse code well enough to, to, to determine whether or not... Uh, I'm still working on that one. <laughs> well, see, you can actually, with your computer programming skills, you can write an app that will interpret Morse code and then... So. That's an idea, yeah. <laughs> How did you get involved in programming and, and thus uh, into, in, involved in satellites? In the beginning, in the beginning? Yeah, yeah sure, from the beginning. <laughs> Well, I was an 80s baby, so I, I grew up with cartridges, game cartridges. So I grew up with Mario, I grew up with Street Fighter, and... Um, you struck it, me as a Street Fighter. Really? Out there. Yeah, <laughs> I, I sensed that. Yes, yes, I love Street Fighter, um, Mortal Kombat, all those. And um, one day I discovered that I can code for games, and I didn't realize that until later on in my life. So that's how I initially got into programming. Now it's a little bit different. I, I just do it because I enjoy it. But yeah, that was the initial spark. Is there anything that you've done here that has been something that you never thought you'd do uh, with the CUNYSAT program? Well, I, I, never, I never thought that I would be involved with writing code to control an antenna system. That's one thing that I didn't think I would be involved with. How did you get involved with writing code? I've just always been interested in taking things apart and putting them together. And after you've done that a few times, you want to see how it runs, what really makes it run, besides the power. What was something interesting that you took apart that you learned how it 
it actually worked. That would be my first video game system when I was 13. What's up with video game systems in Mega Everest College? Well, you have to take a break from all your research and all your studies. And the best way to do that sometimes is to play a game and get lost in a maze. What's next for you? What are you working on now where you can bring all that real life experience from CUNYSAT to bear? Well, what's the next project for, for you? Hopefully I can get a job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get a job. That's got to be impressive to go in and try to get a job when you have a satellite flying in space. Oh yeah, definitely. I really, that was a great opportunity working on that satellite and I'm pretty sure that now my resume will look way better than before on paper, but also on all the skill that I acquire to here. Mm. Because when you get out of school, you might get a sense that you know about it, but from the theory, okay, to the real life, I, mean, I would say like to the practice, it's really different. Uh, the skill and the experience was really, there's no word for it. I don't think like nobody can put a price on it. I understand some of you and your team will be actually be out at the launch of this mission? Yes, for our team, this is the first time many of us are gonna actually see a launch live. Mm. And the excitement is overwhelming. I remember when I was a kid, I was always wanting to, you know, see a launch for the first time and getting this opportunity is like a dream come true. Um, definitely, I feel like, you know, I'm one step closer to my dreams and I just, you know, I, I really, I'm really excited. Launch sequencer start, launch enabled. 10, the nine, launch vehicle, go eight, for launch. Seven, six, five, four, three, two. Well, you have RD-180 ignition and liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket here in the NRO L-39 mission for the National Reconnaissance Office. What was most fascinating about seeing the launch from our vantage point was at other launches we seemed to see either the shuttle or the rocket kind of move away. This sort of seemed to go straight up. It was kind of a unique perspective that I'd never seen before at a launch. I think it was the closest too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, you some really of the workers were saying that we were about a mile out you know, from the launch pad, which we're usually used to two, three miles uh, for normal launches, the East Coast. And we're back with Nick from Cal Poly. Uh, how you doing, Nick? Good, how are you guys? But not too bad, and uh, we actually have the infamous Peapod in front of us, or a sample of what is actually on the spacecraft right now. And take us kind of through what, what this Peapod's all about. So this Peapod is a uh, space-designed, built, tested, and proven glorified jack-in-the-box. Uh, so you can fit, as you can see here, this is a three U's worth of length, and this is one U. Um, so this is, you know, the 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters. So what happens is we bolt this to the rocket. Okay. And when the main payload has deployed and, and launch services have just determined that it's an appropriate time, okay. they'll deploy the CubeSats out of the Peapod. The four CubeSats that are connected to Alana, we probably have a variation of it being 1U, 2U, and 3U. Correct. Right? Okay. Is the Peapod just being used for the NASA CubeSats or... Are they being used for all 12 CubeSats? The Peapod's going to be used for, for all 12 CubeSats, okay. correct. So, and so how's that work then with Cal Poly? So if I'm, let's say for example, if I'm Medgar Evers College, do they send the satellite to you to put it into the Peapod? Do you send them an, an example of the Peapod so they can work with it to see that it fits? Correct, we do have test pods that we'll send out for okay. fit checks and vibrations testing towards the end of the process before integration. Mm -hmm. Typically teams will travel to Cal Poly and do their final vibrations and any vacuum testing they might need to do with us with the flight hardware. I got a question for you guys, and this is this is kind of a different kind of question. Now, now that you've both, you know, designed and built a, a CubeSat. Are you going to try to maybe do more CubeSats? Or are you going to try to do bigger satellites? Because CubeSats are now becoming very uh, popular in their own right uh, across the science and engineering community. Um, this is actually a stepping stone for us. Um, learning all of this and putting all of this knowledge together will help us to further our development. Um, if we actually go ahead and pursue a second CUNY set, we will definitely make it a lot, you know, a lot more complicated and, you know, and, and basically take it to the next level. Mm. Mm. Well, by next level, 
earns mean we're going to have maybe like a better scientific uh, mission. And maybe, you never know, get a bigger, move out of the CubeSat, maybe get a real, you know, satellite, functioning satellite. I don't know if you guys out there have noticed that uh, these two students now have a little bit of moxie. Uh, they're actually uh, acting like veterans now. Uh, I, I tell you, it's it's great. It's awesome. And uh, how's it feel to be about ready to witness uh, your satellite take its first flight? Blair, the feeling is amazing. <laughs> Seeing this this small cube develop into a fully functional satellite yeah. is amazing. And I have my teammates here to support me. Yes. You know, see my first launch live, it's you know. It's, it's, it's something I'll cherish like for the rest of my life. Honestly, if you heard the saying, hard work pays off. This is a testament to it. Oh, there As it goes. You can wow. see it goes Wonderful. right there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bridget, a couple weeks ago, we were in Brooklyn, and you were preparing to uh, come on out here to uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base uh, to see the launch of uh, Alana 2 and the deployment of the CUNYSAT. Uh, now that it has happened, uh, what's going through your head here? Oh, everything and it's, it's just everything. I'm already ready to start focusing on CUNYSAT 2 as we track CUNYSAT 1. And it's just really fantastic right now. My, my, my heart is just pounding a million miles an hour. And it should, and it should be. Uh, Owen, uh, we didn't talk to you when we were in, in Brooklyn, but you saw your, your satellite uh, deployed. Uh, what's going through you, you know, your head right now? Uh, just quite a lot of things. Uh, I was a first systems engineer on the project, and it's just amazing to see this project that we started so many years ago just come into fruition, launching. And it's, it's, it's like watching all these ideas, all the hard work of the students giving, just being thrown out there from the Peapod. It was amazing. I can't wait to see the first data coming down from the satellite. Speaking of data, uh, to actually receive that first bit of data, that first beacon. It's going to be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to jump sky high. Mm -hmm. It's, it's going to be completely awesome. And once we know we have that first beacon, then we know... We're ready for the second CUNY set. Oh, and tell us a little bit about, you know, the next steps for you uh, in this program moving forward with CUNY set and moving on toward CUNY set too. Well, I know that we have a lot of plans that were on this particular satellite that are just going to be moving forward to the next one and then the next one, right? So CUNY set two is going to be bigger, better right now. Like Ernst said earlier, this is going to, this is kind of like our stepping stone. So CUNY set two is going to be flying more science. It's going to be flying more technology. We're hoping to get a lot more effort from a lot of the other institutions in CUNY with it too. So we'll, it'll just be bigger, better, better, and all the more awesome. <laughs> Well, what a success. <laughs> now we've had deployment of the CubeSats. We had a great launch this evening and we've wrapped up, it seems like a 24 hour coverage of the mission. There's only two things left now is one is for the schools to communicate with their satellites yep. and for everyone to get some sleep. We may go to get some sleep. Uh, to, a, to a man and woman, they all were going back to look to get data. Right. I mean, they weren't resting. They're, they're excited to go actually hear from their satellites. I tell you, they got a lot of energy, a lot of enthusiasm. And, uh, we wish them well.